You'll often hear guitarists and gearheads talk about mids and how important they are to the sound of a guitar, but then they just start shredding or tweaking knobs and they never really explain the fundamentals like what are mids? Why are they important? And what happens to your mids in the average guitar rig? In this video, I'm gonna try to answer those questions. First, what are mids? Well, according to the venerable Guitar World magazine, the range of frequencies that human beings can hear and that you hear in music can be broken down like this. Using this framework, mids could mean any part of your guitar's sound that falls between 150 hertz and 3000 hertz. That's like everything. I mean, the open D string in standard tuning is 147 hertz and the highest note that you can play on a guitar. And I'm actually talking about a guitar with 24 frets that goes all the way up to a super high E. That's 2,637 hertz. Less than 3,000, I mean, it's still mids. And yes, every sound that you make on a guitar, especially if you're using distortion, creates overtones and undertones, and those can be much higher than the mids range, but you get the point, right? Most of what you're gonna touch and play on a guitar is mids. So when people say that mids are important for guitarists, they're kind of just saying that guitar is important for guitarists. That's like a nothing. Why would they even say that? It's because mids do matter in a few ways. The first is that the relative quantity and volume of different sections of the mids define how a guitar sounds relative to other instruments, including in a band or recorded mix. I mean, when I play notes up here, those are notes that a bass guitar basically cannot play. And they are mids, and so in a sense, the mids sounds created by this help separate it from other stringed instruments. Second, making small adjustments to frequencies in the mids range can result in a noticeable sonic change. And third, some of the fundamental differences between Fender amps and Marshall amps or Vox amps partly boil down to how each of those amps' unique tone stack affects mids. I think that third point explains a lot about why it can be hard to shop for gear. About why it can be hard to shop for gear based on YouTube demos. I saw this recently in the release cycle for the JHS hard drive. I first watched JHS's own release video and I was honestly underwhelmed. But Josh Scott made a big deal about how other YouTubers had done demos, so I went looking for those demos. I clicked on one by the channel Riffs, Beards, and Gear, and I was blown away. The pedal sounded awesome and radically different from in JHS's video. There are probably several factors influencing that, including that Fluff, the guy from that channel, specializes in high gain and metal. He's doing a different thing and he does it well. But I think there's another critical factor, amp EQ, or in Fluff's case, the lack thereof. Josh Scott ran the hard drive into a Kemper profile of an old Fender basement amp. He uses those style of amps a lot, usually with the knobs at or around noon. And those settings would take the sound of guitar plus hard drive and put it through an EQ curve with this shape. You see that? That's a significant volume cut. The bottom is at 500 hertz, but the cut is really affecting everything that constitutes mids. I mean, by contrast, this is what it looks like if you put the knobs at noon on a Marshall amp. And this is what it looks like if you put the knobs at noon on an old Ampeg V4 like the one I have sitting right over there. Remember how the sound changed when I tweaked the sliders on that old graphic EQ? Those were slight changes to the mids, but each of these graphs compared to each other, they're, they're radically different in the mids. I mean, it's no wonder that people are passionate about their amp preferences. Each amp and amp tone stack is having a significant impact on like 
all of the sounds a guitar makes. Now let's look again at the tone stacks for the Fender and for the Ampeg. The Ampeg actually uses a completely different style of tone stack than the Fender. It's called a James or Back Sandall tone stack. I think it's a James dual capacitor, but that's not the point. The point is that with the knobs at noon, it results in a radically different EQ curve. I mean, it's basically flat. There's a very slight, actually, increase bump in the mids but it's, it's pretty much flat and that's good to know because if you plug into an old ampeg and set the knobs at new and expect it to sound like an old fender you're gonna be disappointed because those knobs and the electronics that they affect are doing something totally different to the mids the, the body the soul of your guitar now what else has a flat eq response like that ampeg if you plug directly into the power section of any amplifier you bypass the preamp circuit and the tone stack that lives in that preamp section. That's exactly what Fluff was doing in his video and what other metal specialty gear reviewers did in their videos. They didn't plug into the front end of an amp for most of their examples. They plug straight into a power section and in doing so they dodged the mid cut that is applied by most of these amps. So it's possible that a big part of the sonic difference between JHS's video and these other demos is really about mids. Time warp and let us continue with our investigation. I have plugged my guitar into the hard drive and the hard drive into the power amp of my V4, thereby bypassing the tone stack within. I'm going to play around and dial in a sound that I like in this specific context. <laughs> I'm going to unplug this from the power amp input on this and put it right into the front of the amp. Nothing else about the setup has changed, but will the sound change? <laughs> It's not night and day, but there is a difference. And that makes sense because the tone stack is doing a few things that all add up to cutting mids. And with the mids go some of the body, the presence, the power of an electric guitar. The sound wasn't bad going into the front end of the sandpeg, but now that I know it could be more, I want it to be more. So let's see what we can do to adjust the shape or maybe the depth of the mid scoop that's being imposed by this amp. Note that I'm going to try each of these things individually and then undo it before I start the next example so I'm not stacking them on top of each other. I'm trying them sort of as like isolated tips to adjust mids. First, I'm going to reset all of the knobs on the EQ so that they're right at noon and applying that flat EQ curve that I showed you earlier. <laughs> mess with the parametric mids control on the hard drive which is itself really really powerful i ended up with a sound that i liked <laughs> And finally, I thought I would try the classic boost the mids trick. This is done most simply and probably most often using something like a tube screamer, but I just use that EQ pedal with a giant hump in the mids. <laughs> That's a bunch of different ways and means that affect the mids content of my guitar's sound. Let's hear them back to back so that we can really listen to the differences. <laughs> sure that tomorrow I'm going to feel like all those things sound good, but I do hope that I have told you and showed you what mids are, why they matter, and some of the ways that they can work or be affected in your average guitar rig. Now, I'm not the last word on any of these concepts, but I did want to introduce them so that the next time you're watching a gear demo, you can consider these factors and what they're doing to the sound of the guitar and other elements 
in that video and maybe even begin to think about how those factors might be different, better, worse if you were to bring that piece of gear home. Grab some f drone, leave it on your porch, I don't know. And that's it, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. If you have thoughts, questions, quibbles, comments, leave them in the comments. I always appreciate your time. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you around. That's fun.